Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about web scraping and API. It's actually really fun. Um, and I want to spend some time today. And if I don't uh, finish all the material, I will continue next lecture uh, because those are potential things for you to think about for your final project. Um, before I start the material today, um, I sent a message over uh, Canvas that um, it's a letter of support from the School of Computing. And we understand it might be stressful time for students who are might from Ukraine or nearby countries given the current conflict. So if you um, need counseling, there is the information I provided that College, College of Engineering have a dedicated student counselor to help with students in such stressful situation. Okay. All right, so today there are roughly three small pieces of um, uh, Jupyter Notebook that we're gonna go through. One is web scraping, which is how do you uh, get information specifically from web pages, uh, static web pages, uh, HTML files. Um, this is gonna take some time. And I would consider this to be a more sort of uh, hands-on and heavy duty uh, uh, data scraping. Now, the, one, the other one we're gonna talk about is how do you use existing API? Uh, we're gonna talk two specific APIs. One is an API for International Space Station uh, where you can query to see where the International Space, Space Station is at this time. There's also the other one, which is the Twitter API, which allow you to send and retrieve Twitter. And depends on the level um, of your account, you have essentially a limit how many tweets you can query within a time frame. Okay, so um, traditionally we have been covering starting from HTML, moving on to International Space Station and Twitter. Um, but today I'm going to go it backwards. I'm going to start with the Twitter one because I think you know if you want to have fun with your final project, this is one potential uh, interesting API you can play with um, and get a lot of interesting data for your analysis and visualization tasks. So that's where I'm going to start. But before I start everything, I need to introduce uh, sort of the idea of an API. Okay, so this is a file APIS-ISS. Okay, so there's three Python notebook today. This is the one that labeled APIS ISS. And the idea is the following. Um, there are more hands-on data scraping which work uh, with HTML, where, which we're going to go towards the end of the class. But many times, um, if you want to get data from uh, the internet, a lot of web pages has a built-in API to allow you to query their data. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a, it's a well-defined interface for consuming the data or more generally for interacting with a remote program on a server. So it enables you to read the data, but also design so that you could write some softwares or apps to interact with the API. So for example, you can write your own Twitter client, which we're gonna see an example of. So there's many examples of document API, for example, from Stack Exchange, from Twitter, from Facebook, uh, from Keg, from Google Maps, um, and many more. And many of those API require some form of authentication and have rules on what you are allowed to do and what not to do. So following those rules, uh, if you don't follow those rules, actually, you might get blocked by the website. Um, so working with API is like working with a website, but instead uh, you kind of interface with the API to try to obtain the data behind uh, on the server. So the type of um, API uh, we are going to try to get, uh, actually let me start with International Space Station because this is one that does not require um, authentication. So specifically, um, you know, the API have a form like this. So this is essentially uh, a server where you can request information, okay? 
And then in this particular case for International Space Station, uh, you are going to use what's called request library, which is basically handles communication with the server. So uh, of course, before you do that, you should have this installed, but let me first hide all the output for now. Okay, so in order to get information from International Space Station, um, what you're going to do is you import the library requests and then you just essentially send a request. So if I do this, it's going to re return a response with the code 200. So what does this mean? You know, most of you knows the code for 404, right? So uh, 404 means that the resource tried to access is not found on the server. For when you get a response of 200, it means everything went okay and you have obtained a response. So we can actually go and uh, look into what we get uh, from this specific query. So, and, and again, other codes such as 301 is redirecting to a different endpoint, 401 is thinking that you are not authenticated, 400, they think you made a bad request, 43, uh, the resource you are trying to access is forbidden. And then there's 404, which is not found. So when we move on to the Twitter API, Twitter have different level of developer account. So if you are at the lowest level of their account, which I think is what they nowadays call the essential account, if you actually run the code um, within the Python um, a Jupyter notebook, you're going to get a full three arrow. And then they're going to tell you, even though they managed to authenticate you, but you don't have the right level of access to make that specific query. So likely you're going to get a full three arrow if your account does not have the right access level. So they change their API bid. That's why I have to update the code too. Uh, it turns out the code needs to run for the next level beyond essential. And then you need to sort of apply it. I, I send a, a Canvas announcement too. In order to run that code, you need to apply for the next level up of access in order to use the specific code we have in the example. All right, now, if I actually provide a URL that is not valid, then it's going to return, like I said, 400, where the server thinks that you make a bad request. Now, most of this lecture, we're just going to talk about get, there's other sort of HTTP method, and we are going primarily focus on obtaining uh, using the get comment. Okay, so remember I send a request and they come back with a response. Now let's look at what that response is. So if I do dot content, what it's actually telling me is at time of the query, uh, it's returning to me as what the time and if I'm successful in getting you know, the response. And most important part is the International um, Space Station's location, uh, the longitude and the latitude information at the time of query. So now this is actually, B means it's a binary um, and it stores this information. In fact, this is stored as a JSON type file. So for example, if I do content type, it's going to return to say this, whatever responsive return is in a JSON format. But now you can decode this format to make it more readable by using response.content.decode. And this is like one of the more standard decoding and print the response. And then this printed out to be something a little bit more readable. Again, timestamp and all the other location information. So this is the same information in JSON file as if I reformat it slightly better. Again, it has the location of ISS and the timestamp. Now, of course, Python being fairly powerful, there is a specific JSON library that can take this JSON file and put it in an even better format, meaning that in this particular case, we're going to using json.loads to load this JSON file and it's going to treat it uh, as a format like this. And it's, a, um, it's like a dictionary, okay? 
Now, of course, not surprisingly, we have learned a bunch about Panda. So Panda can deal with this even better. So you can directly, Panda has a read JSON uh, function. So it again can parse it in the way. So now if you look at JSON, uh, so Panda is actually putting it in this really nice table format of you know, uh, latitude and longitude and also uh, the corresponding positions. Now, it looks fine, but it's not exactly what we want. So we actually want to convert it slightly better by defining what's called the flatten function here. What this does is actually just try to put every row per timestamp with longitude and longitude as columns. So this is this particular code here is trying to flatten the table into something even more readable. And of course here timestamp is a little bit not readable. So we want to really eventually convert this timestamp to human readable form. So that is, um, that is what we will do next. But before we do that, what we are going to do is instead of doing one single query, we are going to query the location of the International Space Station every three seconds. So what we're doing here is this time dot sleep is sort of I'm delaying the query for every three seconds and ask it's going to return us. So it's the same as we are going to get a request uh, for each time I'm going to pull the position and I'm going to pull this position every three seconds. And now what am I going to do It's going to take a little time. So as you can see here, well, my internet is actually a little bit slow. So it's appear to be slightly more than three seconds, but this is what is trying to query a uh, 10 timestamps of where um, that's even longer than usual. Uh, because we're kind of in the basement. So as you can see that uh, the ISS is moving. So each time we're getting a slightly different location. Now we can convert what we have just queried those 10 different locations into a data frame, all right? So again, we're going to load this into a data frame. And then this is what I was talking about. I'm going to two date time. So I'm going to convert it into the proper human readable timestamp. And then this is what we get. So it says, you know, right now, I don't know which time zone it is, <laughs> is every three seconds where, you know, it's today and every three seconds where the location is, okay? So now I have obtained the position of the space station. The next thing I can use what we have learned earlier, which is plotting or visualization. We can use matplotlib to actually plot, uh, use specifically we're using scatter plot where X axis is the latitude and Y axis is the longitude to plot the location of the space station. Not too surprising, it's just moving kind of along a straight line. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is an example where you can query uh, API without having to provide authentication. And the last bit I want to add here is you can query with parameters. So if you actually look at this particular link right here, this is the link we are sending our query to. And after this question mark is after the parameter. So what we're trying to figure out is when is the space station going to be at this location? All right. So same as before, I'm going to provide the URL we're sending our query. Now coordinates is basically our parameter. So what is this longitude? Anyone guess where this is? Salt Lake City. <laughs> so we just want to know when the, when the um, space station is going to fly over Salt Lake City. So what do we do? Again, we're going to do the request.get, providing the URL and the parameters, and, uh, and then parse the data. OK? So of course, this data is now, again, in the JSON file format. Uh, it's come back with a response. Uh, duration and time, and lets me convert it again to something human readable. It basically says that tomorrow morning around nine o'clock is where the International Space Station is going to pass through Salt Lake City. 
Okay. So I think this is very cool because in some sense that you are using API in the specific case to obtain data from a particular server. And then you can use those as a pre-processed stage to collect your data potentially for your project and perform analysis and visualization tasks. Okay, so for people who are remote, again, I don't necessarily see your chat. So if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself um, and remind me that you have a question. Okay, so that is API for International Space Station. The next thing I'm going to do is the Twitter API. So there actually has been many interesting projects surrounding um, analysis and visualization of Twitter data. Um, and you know, later on when we um, started talking about the class project, I might give a few examples of past project um, and, and also commercial products that is utilizing uh, Twitter data. So um, for using the Twitter API, what you need, um, you know, other than International Space Station, there's many other servers which require uh, authentication. And for example, specifically, uh, Twitter API requires you providing API key and API key secret in order to interface with the API. So, uh, so most of those um, sort of popular ones, um, you know, the companies who hold the data want to have control over how much uh, they let you query their data set. So what we are doing, you know, of course, through the Twitter API, you can directly interface with API with sort of uh, Python programming. But what we are going to do today is we're going to utilize a wrapper. There's more than one wrapper, but specifically, we're going to use what's called the Tracing Library, which is a wrapper surrounding the Twitter API. If you don't have it, the first thing you need to do is to install this library as before. And again, if you're using Python 3, do PIP3 install. So unfortunately, this specific process is going to take a little time because um, as if you're going anything, so if you look at this particular thing here, this is where you can look at developer portal and then you can look at different level of developer. The level that we would like you to get in order to get this code to run, or if you are interested in a course project for your class, um, it would be useful for you to get either elevated access or academic access. So um, those access give you a little bit more power to query the Twitter data. So what you need to do is to first sign up for a developer account and then inside the developer account, once you get it, you need to create an app. And once you have set up the app, you can then generate your API key and API key secret. And then what you need to do is there, there is this credential file. Of course, I have my credential, which I'm not gonna share, but this is where you're gonna put your credential in there. And then once you have a credential, you're gonna put it in that file um, and then you can run the following code, okay? So before we do that, let's first look at how a tweet actually looks like when you send a request, when you obtain a tweet. It's again in this um, JSON-like format. First of all, it's talking at, well, this is a specific older tweet. It's created last year. It has the timestamp, the ID, the string, and, um, and then the text. And a lot of times this is probably the most Important one. This happened to be a tweet that coming out of Joe Biden's account and talking about meeting some uh, meeting the Mexican president. Okay, and then there's other things. Um, um, there's, there's other information that is within here in this tweet. Specifically, later on, what we're going to look at is retweet count and favorite count. So it's basically the statistic associated with that specific tweet how many people has retweeted and how many people like it and so on and so forth, okay? So, so again, the first thing you do in order to query uh, Twitter data is to load your credential. So there's an empty credential.python, which is you're going to load. And then I'm here just loading my credentials. Um, and then I'm going to call the library and create this object, okay? 
If everything goes fine, you should not get any error message. And now the first thing I'm going to do, oh, let me hide my, actually, let me hide this string here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to search for any tweet that has a hashtag COVID-19. And what they do is provide the tag and it returns the result. So, so right now, I guess, I don't know which timestamp this is, but this is querying a number of tweets. And of course it's not necessarily English. So you see some foreign language ones as well. And it just shows some tweet that is surrounding this specific thing, specific hashtag, okay? So there's a number of them. Now, of course, today, what's in the news is the wall. If we can do that, this will be sort of the tweet just now that is surrounding the um, Ukraine conflict. Okay, so again, Twitter does search, search for specific tweets that follow certain tag and depends on the, your access level, you have an upper limit of how many tweets you can query within a month's time. I believe, I don't remember exact number, I think for academic accounts, you can go upwards like 100K or more. Now, if you look at this, this is a pretty complicated uh, sort of JSON file format with all the information of the tweets. And of course, there's many tweets surrounding this topic. What we are going to do is we are going to access just the first elements of the array and I'm only accessing the full text part of it. So if I do this, this is just obtaining one single tweet, the first tweet in this array. If I change this, this is now the second tweet, right? So you can access the full text of the tweet. Now you can also print all tweet. So in this case, remember my result is array and I only going to get the full text of it. I'm going to separate all the tweet um, by this dotted line. So if I do that, I'm just obtaining all the tweets that is on this topic, only the main text. Okay. So now we're going to perform a specific analysis using the Twitter data. Uh, the specific thing we're going to do is we're going to compare Twitter popularities of political figures. And we happen to choose uh, the POTUS account um, and uh, AOC's account. So we're not using Joe Biden's account, um, um, you know, in a, in a way that the POTUS account actually has a smaller number of followers. Um, and then Joe Biden's account normally retweet from the POTUS account. So, now, what we're doing here is to search for tweets based on username, right? So of course in here, you can use Joe Biden. Oh, actually I ended up using Joe Biden. Um, and then we are getting again, the what's coming out of, um, what's coming out of this specific user, all right? Again, in specifically, we are printing out the full text. Okay, I believe NATO should act now and blah, blah, blah. So this is um, sort of real time query of the Twitter information. Okay. Now, what happened is that if you actually use a wrong name, you actually, um, you will not be able to, you will get an error message. And here is what we're trying to get is sort of the timeline and we're only going to count the um, we're going to look at the last 3,200 3, tweets of a user. Um, well, actually this is last 50 of them, okay? So again, you know, this is again in this more complicated JSON format and looking at these tweets from this particular user. So what we're going to do next is to look at this um, tweets from um, Biden and specifically look for favorites and retweets. So again, 
this is the results Biden as underscore result is the tweets that we have queried. And now what we're going to do is look at what is the favorite count and then retweet count for each of the tweet. Okay. So, so essentially it's actually reporting those numbers, but of course it's not very readable. So uh, later it's, well, it's, 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 it's okay. So in a sense that we are appending the, um, the main text and in this specific case, the favorite count. But then I'm accumulating those counts together into, um, into our array. So we can also do the same thing with AOC. So again, the screen name is AOC and we are going to get again, uh, the 50 tweet, right? So, so of course those are political figures. So pretty much uh, I think AOC has been talking quite a bit about student loan and so on and so forth, uh, wealth inequality and so on. So the same thing as before, we are going to, again, for each of her tweet, we're going to get the favorite count as well, together with the main text. And then we're going to accumulate those counts in, in an array. So of course, um, this is all the main text of her tweet. Uh, I think it's, and then we are going to now, once we have obtained the results from both political figure, we're going to create a data frame. So in this particular case, once you put in the data frame, things became a bit more readable. And for example, what I'm going to do is to show the Biden statistics. So in this case, you know, this particular tweet has how many favorites and how many retweets, this particular one, how many favorite, how many retweets, and so on. And you can then looking at the count, sort of the statistics of those. Similarly, you can do, um, of course you can sort them. In this case, I'm going to sort them by the, the favorite and, and then this is the sorted order. Of course, the top ones are related to the current political crisis. Okay, and then the last, this is the last 10. Same thing we're going to do for the AOC. Again, we're going to sort them based on, based on the word um, text, uh, what the main text, the uh, over uh, the fave statistics. And now what we're going to do is we combine them and try to plot them and to do a comparison to see who is a little bit more favorite among two political figures. So combine is just creating those two things together that you know each of those curve now, this is using the plot functionality um, uh, as we learned in two lectures ago. Um, the blue is a fave, uh, AOC favorite. Um, the orange is AOC retweet and uh, green is Biden favorite and red is Biden retweet. So it looks slightly, you know, in a way that Biden is slightly on the higher end, so slightly more favorite. And of course, I'm going to leave you as this. You can also query if you actually care about, you know, the Russian government account, since you can also query POTUS. This is sort of the Twitter handle for Kremlin. And again, you know, you can look at uh, what is happening on the other side of the world. I will leave you as it is. You can perform similar analysis um, where this is just a very small taste of how you can interact with the Twitter API. Um, you can query um, tweets from specific users. Um, you can collect those tweets, you can parse the tweet, you can uh, get some statistic associated with each tweets and so on. So I want to spend some time on this because it might lead to a very interesting class project uh, if you're interested in study Twitter data. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I am going to give five minutes break um, and we'll return at 4.15 to go back to more hands-on <laughs> exercise with how to scraping traditional HTML without the API. So um, your hands will get a little bit more dirty in terms of trying to scraping those data set. Okay.
Any question? Classroom or remote? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So um, if, if you scroll up a little bit when you scrape like Joe Biden's tweets, for example. Yep. Um, are, are you scraping like the tweets from just today or? Oh, yeah, it's um, so if you actually look at the timestamp, uh, actually doesn't matter who it is. If you look at even the Kremlin, I believe this is, I, <laughs> I couldn't translate it exactly because I don't know exactly what this time zone is, <laughs> um, but it should be uh, today's tweet. And then to add on to that, so just for this, you know. Oh, sorry. If it's to, if they are actually active today, right? So you are okay. you are just querying the most recent ones, essentially. Yeah. And then so in this, you said like count is fifty, so you're you're pulling like the fifty most recent tweets. But if you don't have count equals fifty, how many tweets are you pulling? Like. I think you can go upwards. I think somewhere here. Let me see. Upwards, you can do, I believe, thirty two hundred. Uh, hold on one second. I think that number is somewhere. Count is limited to the last 3,200 tweets of a user. Okay, so when you when you search like for uh, you know for COVID nineteen, the results actually did pull all 3,200 tweets. Um, I don't think so, actually. Uh, so you need to check the syntax. If I don't provide this, what is the default? So I assume it's probably at most 200. Per okay. Request. Okay. I see. Okay. But if you wanted all 3,200, then you would just do count equals 3,200 or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to change it because then my screen is going to. Uh, no, of course. Yeah. Because it just looks like a <laughs> yeah. really small list. So I was just yeah. confused. Okay. Yeah. So the most, the most scenario, what you're going to do is you're going to embed this into some of your code so that once you finish the uh, query, you save it on a, on, on a text file or save it down. You don't necessarily just display it right away, right? It's really for obtaining the data and perform any type of downstream analysis you want to do. Okay, thank you. Yep. I think, you know, again, with a different record, I can go to my account to kind of show people how much... Uh, so for example, I can pull, I haven't pulled it since I established it for today. This one, we can, I can pull 10 million tweets uh, from academic account. So it's actually quite a big number. Yeah, when you actually apply for the Twitter developer account, they're gonna ask you for a justification of what you're gonna use it for and, and what sort of app are you developing and so on. Yes. Um, to add on to that question, does yeah. it take the date when you're recording? Yes, well, I don't remember the exact, um, I don't remember exact syntax. So where you're gonna to go to check the syntax is, uh, is I think it's here. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> this is, <laughs> This is, there's actually two separate API. There's the at API and then the ones we are using is Twitter API. So there are specific documentations you can look into in how you can actually, uh, so this is the access level I'm talking about. Uh, if you just get essential, you might not run the code. You will need to at least elevate it level. And if you're a student, I believe you can apply for academic research level too, uh, and so on and has different things. And then it's also, you know, there's, you know, this, this is sort of like entire documentation. Um, and of course, if you want to develop a course project using Twitter API, this is your uh, best friend is to get familiar with our newest documentation. They change their access pattern from last version as well. So there's a little bit difference from uh, previous iterations of how to talk to Twitter API. Oh, and also to be careful, I showed you it's Twitter API. There's also this, I'm using a wrapper. So if you want to use this wrapper, this wrapper has specific documentation, the twice on mapper. So this one has, uh, has also examples of how to use this API. So you can also, if you want to use a wrapper without directly talking to the API, you want to get familiar with, uh, with, um, with this particular uh, uh, 
library. Okay. And to be fair, those libraries actually make your life easier. Uh, so you don't directly uh, write Python code to uh, interact with API, which is a little bit more tedious uh, in terms of coding. And this one has a bunch of examples. How do you follow a user? How do you update status and so on and so forth? Okay, all right, let's get back to, so we have seen Twitter API, we have seen um, International Space Station API. Let's go back to sort of the, what have started all this HTML. How many of you have ever coded in HTML? Anyone in the audience here? No? Okay, so, which means let me give you a quick introduction of HTML. Uh, almost all pages uh, goes back down, especially in the old days uh, in this what's called hypertext makeup language. It's been roughly 25 years since the introduction of HTML. So it's really what's considered a, a markup language. Okay, so now, the latest version, which is HTML5, goes beyond the typical markup. It actually now can embed graphics, audio, video, and so on. Um, pretty much, it's a scripting language such that the browser can understand the content of your web page. Okay. At the center of HTML is what's called elements. So each element is a content surrounded by a pair of tags. So in this case, the content is saying that this is an HTML element, which is a sentence. And the tag is says the strong tag. The strong is basically changing the font of this text. So basically in strong in HTML means I'm going to make this particular text bold. That's what strong means. So you can also nest those elements. For example, the sentence is nested by this U and slash U. This means that whatever is nested in here, I'm going to put it, U means underline. So I'm going to put this sentence underline and then strong and strong means that I'm going to put this sentence and then the, the sentence outside to be all bold uh, font, okay? Now the most important part, which is in some sense, the fundamental small element of internet is embedding of links. So the link basically says that, okay, this is a text associated with a link. And then the, the, the tag you're going to define is essentially A means it's a link and then href provide the corresponding link. So if I actually load up this particular sentence in the browser, oops, if I send this in the browser, it means that it's going to, when you click on this, it's going to take you to google.com, okay? Oh, sorry, I, know, I really want to highlight here. So, a stands for anchor, but it really means that this is a reference or a link that I'm going to take one to another. So here is an example of a hollow word example of the minimal HTML page. So for example, in this particular case, it's, it has a header. And then the header is really, if you look at here where my mouse is, this is really specify what this web page is. And then the body is really the main text of the body. Okay, so header usually contains what's called uh, meta information, specifically the title of this page. And then the body contains actual content. So one thing that is important for HTML is that it has a natural hierarchical structure. So again, remember I have a header and now I'm looking at just the body part of the HTML file. In this case, the body has all those tags so again, go inside the body, I'm going to specify there is a piece of article and then in here, um, the class and class, class equal to date, class equal to anchor, think about as different field I'm specified for my, for my web page, right? Uh, what is the time of publication and what is the author of this web page? And h1 slash h1, this means the font. This is sort of a large font for this. And then div means essentially it's specifically the content of, of, of my web page. And then this is a text I'm going to encode. 
And you can again having um, all different blocks of information. And this is, you know, uh, this is basically the lyrics of another uh, of another song. Okay. In HTML, uh, H, uh, HTML, there's also table. So when you specify a table, you're going to first use the table tag to say, I'm going to now specify table. And then I'm going to use TR to specify this is a row. So T, whatever is nested in the TR tag means that I'm going to specify this table row by row. And then the TH is a cell in that row. So in, 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 in other words, this is creating two rows where the first row, the first cell is empty. The second cell contains the Beatles and the third cell contains Led Zeppelin. That is the first row. The second row, the first cell contains band member. The second cell contains number and the third cell contains number. So again, this is just HTML way of encoding a table. So a DOM is, uh, think about it as a programming interface. And usually if I am, for example, in, uh, um, in a particular HTML file, I can actually do what's called inspection. So, so this is the HTML page we just look at, right? It has, remember it has two article tag. This is the first article. This is the second article. If I right click, uh, specifically for Chrome, you can click on inspect. If you're using other browser, there's something similar. You can view source. So if I inspect, you are arriving at the situation where on the right hand side, it's showing the source code of this web page. And then if I hover over each line, it's going to tell me where this line is in terms of the original HTML file. For example, in here, this is highlighting the publication date. In here, it says it's, it's also it's Radiohead. And then here is highlighting the title, right? Which is H1 font, which is a large font and so on. So you can actually use this DOM to inspect your HTML file, okay? Now, the next thing you are going to do is we're going to try to scrape information from an HTML file. And then there is a nice Python library and with a nice name called Beautiful Soup. So Beautiful Soup is a Python library designed to extract data from HTML documents, okay? It also support navigating the DOM environment and retrieving the data elements you need. So we are going to play with the lyrics HTML file that we just saw right here. And we're going to see how we can scrape the data from it. Okay. So first of all, we're going to import the beautiful soup and then we're going to open this HTML file and by calling the HTML parser. So uh, again, let me just hide the output. So now if I actually do this, this is the entire HTML file. You know, it's header, right? It's header, which is lyrics. So you see this title right here, this is a header. And same thing as we described before, the body has two um, articles in there and with the corresponding information. So now you want to make this a little bit more readable. So once you actually have um, queried using beautiful soup, you can do this function called prettify, which is actually a nice word. So you can prettify it and make it slightly more readable and, and in a slightly more formatted way. So for example, in this case, it's kind of reline, you know, span slash span. And so that, you know, the content is nested between those tags in a very nice layout. Now, what's interesting about this, remember I have all this all this class, think about this class as a tag. And if I specify those tag, I can access information. For example, this, is, this, this tag is date, this tag is author. So what we can do is, and also this tag right here is title. Uh, where is the title right here? Okay. So what do we do here? This is going to say dot title, meaning that I'm going to return the title of this page. Okay, so the nice thing about HTML, because it's scripting, it's based on elements. If you know the name of the element, you can query it. But that also presents a challenge because in order to scrape a web page, you first need to go and inspect the web page. 
and to see what tag they have. Okay, you can't, there's no sort of default format every web page is going to take. Of course, most default is going to use title, but there's other different type of uh, syntax in there. So you, the best idea is if you want to scrape a web page first to go through the inspection and look at what sort of tag they have. So now this is title and we can convert the title into a string doing dot string. So it's just lyrics. And then remember we have div elements, which are those paragraphs. So the idea of this is that if I do dot div, it's going to return the first paragraph you're going to see. So this is the first one. So this is this, this paragraph. Leaves are falling all around, it's time I was on my way. Okay. Now, of course, we can convert it to a string and print the string. So it only takes the stream part of this information. So as you can see, compared to Twitter API, Twitter API have a lot of built-in, uh, especially the wrapper has a lot of built-in functionalities where you can directly call those function to get it versus right now when we're scraping the HTML file without a wrapper, we are literally accessing element by elephant in the original web page. Okay. Now again, I can print it out in a string and then just getting the string out. Now, what I would like to do is there is this find function, which is like search. So it says that if I'm going to provide an ID, and I'm going to search the HTML file to find the content associated with this ID. So remember, in this particular case, I have this article which has ID, which is Zip, I guess it stands for Zeppelin. So it's going to return this entire article because the ID for this particular block or particular elements is Zip. So it's returned that specific block. And, um, I can also specifically, once I find that block, I can also call what's called get text. When I do that, I'm just going to get the text associated with it. And what's the text is just the, the actual, you know, content, publish, time, author, and this paragraph and the title. So it's sort of think about it as a cleaned up version from the HTML file. Now, find all, is to say, I'm going to get all instances of a specific tag. So this one, H1, remember H1 is a font. So I'm just going to find all the title in this article that has this font. So if I look at this article, Rainbow On and Burn the Witch, those are the texts that has H1 font. So what it, when you do that, what you get is it's going to return those pairs of elements like this, okay? And then you can also, access this because this is uh, this is really a list so i have a list i'm going to access the first element in this list and that the type is it's a tag it's 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 yeah now you can also go a little bit deeper you can get all the text in those title so you can this is the um this is a syntax for iterate through all elements in this list and you just get the actual title text themselves. You can also find element by their ID. Remember here, I'm finding element by the tag, which is how they are positioned as tag, but also I can also find all the elements with the same ID. So in this particular case, I can search for by ID zip, but I'm gonna find all of them. And specifically, there's only one. So again, I'm gonna return the same thing as before. But you can imagine in an HTML file, I can have IDs, same ID attached to multiple articles, and then this is going to return all of them. You can also search by class. Um, the only thing you want to mention is that the class is a reserved keyword in Python. So you can't say class equal to content. So instead it's class underscore equal to content. This means it's searching for the class in the HTML file. So. Remember, I have all these paragraphs whose class is equal to content, so it's going to return both paragraphs, which are the lyrics. I believe they're lyrics, right? Looks like lyrics to me. Okay, so you can also, and this is not a syntax I will recommend, because the fact that you are going to find all the you know, specific search, you can shorten your search 
by specify, I just want the DIV type of things. So this is really means I'm going to actually call find or of this particular um, tag. So this is a shortened version, but it can be very confusion. So it's not uh, recommended, at least from my perspective. But what it does is again, finding all the DIV tag and return the content associated with them. And then of course the DIV tag is a list. So you can look at this, it has two elements in here. If I do one, it returns the second paragraph which is this piece right here, okay? And of course you can iterate through all of them, which is that for all the DIV paragraph, I'm going to print it, ah, which is right here, okay? So I'm not going too much into CSS. What always come is HTML file, there's a CSS selector. CSS is basically, Think about CSS as changing the style, the look and the feel of your web page. So what is trying to specify is, for example, the color for the article element, the color for the ID, the color for the class, the color for um, direct ch children of a particular class, and then the color for, say, the paragraphs, okay? So, so in a way that it's actually specify um, the look and feel where HTML specify the content. Okay. So this particular syntax right here is looking for the content that is below the ID in the, in the hierarchical tree. Okay. So we have looked at a bunch of different access patterns of how to sort of scrape a HTM file. Let's talk about scraping from a specific website. So I didn't update the, update the code. What we're going to do is we're going to scrape our course catalog from University of Utah. Um, oftentimes before you do that, um, before you start fetching information from a website, uh, you need to look at the website's term of service and specifically the robots.txt from the domain before you start crawling excessively. So again, this is the same thing as using API. Uh, if you are violating their term of service, um, you are might get blocked by that website. Again, they can block you fairly quickly. For example, Google Scholar might block you very quickly if you are crawling the information in the undesirable pattern. Specifically, if you look at their robots.txt, it's going to tell you it's not allowing search. It's, um, it's not allowing the crawling of index. It's not allowing the crawling of citations and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of things they don't want you to do. And especially for example, the subdirectory slash scholar, because you pretty much does not want you to crawl or query dynamically. So sometimes they will also specify something like this, which is really saying that they want you to delay your, your how often you are going to crawl. For example, I think this is like 30 seconds and also only doing a crawl every 30 seconds. So it's actually limit how frequent and how much you can crawl the, 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 the information from that website. So the essential idea is before you start scraping a particular web page, make sure it's a service that the web page allow you to do before you're getting blocked by it. So we know that our U of Utah's course enrollment page does not does allow us to crawl. So let's do that. So specifically, we're just looking at a particular year. This is a spring. I didn't change that. It's, the catalog doesn't really change too much. This is a website we're trying to uh, scrape information from. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by doing this request library, um, urllib.request library. So uh, let's... Well, I have already crowded and we're just going to look at the first 5,000 lines of this page. 
So what do we remember what we just did is this web page. You can also inspect this web page. And then what we did is we, uh, we obtained the first um, 5,000 lines of this web page. Okay, so what do we get out of it, right? So remember, we can crawl this, we can inspect this. Um, let's see, if I go here, like if I click on say accounting major, there's specific line that is highlighted and so on and so forth. So you can actually, again, looking at how the code is corresponding to the HTML file. And specifically, the one we want to look at is we want to get the major, the program name out. And this in the HTML file has a specific class name, you know, which is CLLG-2 and so on. So again, to do those kind of scraping is a little bit painful because you first need to inspect the website you want to uh, scrape from, and then you want to figure out exactly the tag you are interested in and the keyword you're interested. So this, this particular um, code here is building a dictionary of subject shorthand as a tuple. So specifically, um, we are going to get, we're also going to get the link to each of those program. Okay. So if I actually run this code, what you get is you get a list of um, the major, the, the link associated with the class list, another major, and of course, there's also the shorthand of it. Okay, so that's what you get. And specifically, what we in here, there is a little bit split operation going on. You're just looking at the actual layout of the web page and split it into sort of shorthand as well as a complete name. And specifically, if our subject is mass, remember mass is the, sort of the key, then it's going to spell it out as the full name mathematics and together with the link. All right. There are some questions. Could you unmute yourself or do you want me to? Oh, uh, okay. So let me answer some questions. Oh yeah, this is, oh, this is also already answered, good. So now what we want to do more, instead of just getting a single names, we actually want to, um, if you look at this query, each time we specify a query, we just provide the subject shorthand. So we want to actually retrieve the link if we only have the subject shorthand. So first of all, let's first get uh, a list of classes. In this particular case, We are going to again request the URL we provided, and we are going to read read the actual HTML file. Uh, again, we are using Beautiful Soup to process this web page and to parse it, and uh, we are going to open a new file to try to write into uh, to try to write what we obtained. So, let's in this particular case. For example, I'm only interested in computer science schedule. This is sort of the corresponding web page that we query out of by providing subject matter to be CS. Okay. So let's. So let's see if we can go into CS computer science and right here, let's see if we can inspect right here. So this is sort of the corresponding block associated with the CS schedule. Okay, so now what we ultimately want is we want to look at information associated with this course, for example, uh, what is the name of this course? What is the course number? What is instructor? And ultimately, we also want to crawl the enrollment numbers. So specifically, let's start with the link, the name of the course, and so on. So again, if you look at the original code right here, which is right here, and it's a little bit hard to read, right in this block right here, 
we are going to use Panda. Of course, Panda is your best friend in terms of processing this type of information. So before I go into detail of this, let me just show you what the end result does. What this do is that it's actually go over all the CS class, parse the course number, parse the name of the course, the instructor, and the link to the course over the schedule page. And then the one thing that we haven't successfully done is how many students has enrolled for that particular class. And this is what we're gonna cover next. But first of all, let's just look at what is this code doing? It's first going to look at H3 and get text. This is essentially obtaining the course information. So you can print it out. Um, and then here is a number and name of the course. So you are using a little bit string sort of splitting and, and removing empty spaces and section numbers. Um, there's a little bit of avoiding duplication. So this part is useful because for example, courses like 2100 has multiple sessions. So we don't want to get all the uh, uh, like different sessions in the table. Um, and there's again more of string operation um, and then to in, in order to get instructor. For example, in this specific case, we need to do a little bit splitting um, because what happened if you look at this specific case right here, it's, so it's giving the instructor name and then there's a dash and then view feedbacks and so on. So you need to do a little bit string manipulation to obtain the first part of that, which is instruction name. And then you append them all together and convert it into a data frame. So that's what you did, okay. Now you can look at which faculty teaches the most students. I mean, so far we haven't scraped the number of enrollment yet, but I can still do this. Oh, this is actually which faculty teaches the most courses. In this particular case, for example, in this there's, you know, faculty who teach three course and up to like two, or two courses. And most of our school of computing faculty teach only one course a semester. Now the next one, which is the most probably involved one is to try to count the enrollment. And in this specific case, we need to specify the enrollment URL. And again, you are going to ask for open this URL and obtain the information in that URL. We're again using beautiful soup to parse the information. And specifically, if you actually go to a course enrollment, let's say, I think if I click on here, um, it's actually, this is a fairly easy and straightforward HTML file to query. So again, you can inspect. Um, and you basically want to look at how many this particular current enrollment column that you are scraping. So, so now what we have done is we're still using the same sort of data frame as before except now we have added the current enrolled number and then the remaining seats available that is coming from the last two columns from this web page. Okay. And you can, you know, of course, now this is in a nice uh, data frame. You can then query among those, what are the most, um, for example, what is the enrollment for the first the first class right here. And then it says it's a 360. And CS 2420 is one of those largest computer science course. And finally, you can also return to be able to get all students in this particular case. We are looking for what is the largest class, okay? So what we have done is we're going to, um, sort those courses by the enrollment number and return the first 25. Again, 2420 is one of those larger class database, uh, second largest, you know, 3500, those are large major classes in our program. So again, what you do is you access the student's column. Uh, you are using descending, descending order and, and to show the top 25.
So you can ask more complicated questions, which is at which level are the most students enrolled in computer science? So the levels are the leading digits of the course. For example, 2000 level, 3000 level, 5000 level. 5000 level are advanced undergrad, uh, often cross-listed with grad, 600, 6000 level are grad courses, 7000 are seminars and other PhD level classes. So again, once we have queried this data, we can actually look at, you know, what are the highest enrollment uh, course um, uh, sort of grouped by levels. So you can perform essentially a lot of analysis. And again, this is where some of those uh, numping functionalities also comes in. For example, in this particular case, now we're grouping by the level and looking at the total counts. And then what this says is that, you know, the total number of students enrolled in uh, level one are 300, level two are 500, and level three are like a thousand accumulated ones. And then finally, you can also plot this. Again, this is based on different level. You know, remember there is level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven level, and you look at like how students distribute in terms of taking those. And of course, level two and three and four, a lot of those courses are for CS major. So there's a huge amount of enrollment and we have more undergrad and grad students. So the grad student course don't have that much of an enrollment compared to undergrad. And finally, you can also plot things like by, by bar chart as well. So these are some of the things we learned earlier uh, last week, um, different um, plotting things. In this particular case, we're plotting a bar chart. And again, group by level. So it's just showing again, number of students enrollment at different levels. All right, so to wrap up, um, when you are scraping from HTML files, as you can see, compared to using API, it's generally more painful. And it's a very good test of your Python coding ability and your use of data frame. And they are very specific, like usually the code you write to scrape a specific website does not really generalize to any other website because HTML file varies a lot. So pretty much you have to write custom uh, scraping script um, for individual website. Um, so, you know, and again, most of those popular web servers like Facebook and Twitter all provide their specific API to make it easy for you to query their data, but also give them more power to control how much data you can query from them. So anyway, so my suggestion is to look over, you know, and start thinking this is not too early. You actually have to start forming groups to, uh, to do your final project. So if you have not find a partner, please do so through Piazza to try to advertise for your own skill and what you're looking for. And this is also a really good time to start, if you have not done so, to uh, brainstorm with your project partner, what you're gonna do as your final project. I believe the final project proposal is due right after uh, spring break. Okay, so the last bit uh, for the remaining 10 minutes, uh, what I'm encouraging you to do is to go to the exercise scraping. We actually have 10 minutes left today. Um, there's two very simple, uh, simple exercise to try to um, write code to scrape from um, Wikipedia and from Open Notify API. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop live stream and um,